morning, Cornerstone family and friends. Great to have you with us again today as we continue our series on building you. And today's topic is choosing to be untangled. Have you ever played the game Twister? That game has been around for a lot of years. It's a game where someone would spin an arrow and it would land on a certain color and it would determine where a person had, that was playing had to place their hand or their foot on a circle spot on, on this uh, sheet that's on the ground. And you would have to put yourself into a position where you could touch all those different dots when it was your turn and keep your hands and feet on the same, that same spot as you're making the transition. It was always a fun time to play Twister with a group of friends because you could see how one would try to manage to contort themselves and put them into a position where they could still stay in the game by keeping a hand or a foot on the dots that were previously there as they made that change over to a new dot. And usually, you know, if a, if a person moved off their spot, they were out of the game. But eventually, everybody would become fatigued and tired of trying to be in a certain contorted uh, position in order to maintain their spot that somebody would eventually tremble under the, <laughs> under the strain and the whole thing would collapse and everybody would begin to laugh. You know, it was a great game. A lot of times our lives are like that. We get ourselves into situations where we think we can manage and everything is going great, but then it's just that extra little burden, that little strain that we put into our life and it, and it can throw us off course, can't it? And when it comes to building our lives, sometimes we realize that um, our lives can become very tangled. And once I get to that place, we have to evaluate, well, where are we and where are we going? Walter Scott penned that famous word, oh, what a tangled web we weave when we first practice to deceive. And uh, I know that sometimes when we come to our lives in general, we see things that we, we try to manage, we try to get through, and, and sometimes we even deceive ourselves with our ability to manage certain things. When you think of that thought of, oh, what a tangled web we weave, um, a lot of people actually thought that was from Shakespeare instead of Scott, but it was from his poem, Marmion, which was a tale of, uh, a tale of flood and field back in 1808. And, and the phrase here suggests that when you lie or act dishonestly, you are initiating problems and a domino structure of complications will eventually uh, cause it to run out of control. You know, when I think of things that are out of control in our lives and tangled, I came across this article uh, in Brazil. It was, it's called The Matador, and it's from preceptaustin.org of May 13th, 2019. In Brazil, there grows a, a common plant, which um, forest dwellers call the matador or murderer. Its slender stem creeps along the ground, but no sooner does it meet a vigorous tree than it sends out an entangling tentacle, which cleaves and climbs up the tree. At intervals, it starts sending out arm-like tendrils that further entangle the tree. And as the murderer, the matador, ascends, these ligatures grow larger and their clasp becomes tighter. Up and up, this rogue vine will continue to climb until it comes to the loftiest spire of the tree at last, and there it has conquered the tree. Then, as if in triumph, the parasite shoots a huge flowery head above the strangled summit, and there from the dead tree's crown scatters its seed to begin its entangling work again. In a similar way, everyday affairs can suddenly entangle soldiers of Christ, in effect neutralizing their effectiveness in the ongoing spiritual war with the world, with the flesh, and with the devil. Now, there's lots of examples I can think of being tangled. You know, years ago, I was in my grandparents' place in Kelowna, and they had these huge spiders. And it was fascinating to see them spin their webs. And um, sometimes it was like a daily thing because things would come along and people would walk through webbing. Uh, but you'd see these big spiders, and they'd start to put their webs, and they would try to put them in a place where they weren't so visible so that they could catch their prey, their, the other insects that would come along. And I, I remember even as a kid, sometimes I'd pick up little bugs and I'd purposely throw them into the web. That sounds kind of vicious, doesn't it? But you, I, would, uh, I would just watch the spider's interaction and, and it would come towards it and it would try to uh, spin it up and it would try to make sure that it had it there trapped in its web. And, um, you know, I often think of even another thing of Tangled. I look at my wife, sometimes she'll get her necklaces and she'll accidentally get them clustered and they're all tangled up. and painstakingly and patiently I have to go through and, and begin to unweave these chains uh, that she's had that have become entangled. 
And of course, you're not trying to destroy it, so that has to go to the jeweler, but you're trying to make it very precise in, in, in your untangling of that process. And if you've ever been fishing, and you've been fishing with other people, you know that sometimes your lines get all tangled up, and then everybody brings them in, and you're trying to get them all undone and, and get your reel spooled out again so you can get out to fish as soon as you can again. But you know, when it comes to being tangled, I remember Al Pacino said, if you get all tangled up, just tango on. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. You know, our lives um, as human beings can get tangled. I often think of Samson in the Old Testament. And, and when we look back into Judges chapter 13, we discovered that Samson was born. And he was born during a time where the Philistines were in control over Israel. And because of Israel's doing its uh, wicked deeds, that uh, God punished them by putting them into the hands of the Philistines for a 40-year period. So Samson was raised in that time. Now, the Israelites were to be a people kept apart from the other nations around them. And Samson, when he was born, he was dedicated to God. In fact, he was a Nazarite. They were never to cut his hair. He was never to drink alcohol. Uh, he was solely dedicated to God. And God was raising Samson up to become the deliverer of Israel uh, with the Philistines at a later point. We go on to Judges chapter 14 and 15, and there we discover that Samson, as he's aging and getting older, uh, as a young man would typically do, he goes out and he finds a young woman, and in his case, it was a Philistine woman, somebody out of Israel, and he wanted to marry her. So he said, make it happen to his parents. His parents were upset. They said, well, why can't you pick a woman from Israel? And, uh, but his heart was set on that. And actually, when you look at scripture, the Bible says that God was using this as a method of confrontation that would eventually come between Israel and the Philistines. As Samson was getting ready to get married, he put out a, a riddle out to uh, the guests that would be coming, and there's uh, a promise of exchange of garments. If they could figure it out, um, he would give them 30 garments, and if they couldn't figure it out, they would give him 30 garments. As time went on in the preparation of this marriage, um, people came up to Samson's intended wife-to-be and they coerced her and said, either you find out or you're going to be, you know, we'll slaughter you. So she worked them and she got him to give in. And so as soon as that information came across, uh, she was able to relay that to the people that wanted that, that answer. And of course, they were able to answer Samson and he lost that, that uh, condition. You know, um, after that took place, the Bible says that Samson, he left uh, home, went to his parents, and his wife was actually given to another person. And he came back at a later point wanting to connect with his wife to find out that she had been given to another. He was quite angry about it, quite upset. And so he retaliated against these people, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he slayed his enemies. It tells us that for 20 years that Samson led Israel. And um, there's nothing that really says he was being foolish or an unwise leader. It just says that he was for 20 years. But we go on, and 20 years later, Samson, it tells us, went to Gaza and spent a night with a prostitute. And later on, he fell in love with a woman by the name of Delilah. And you've probably heard the story of Samson and Delilah. And the Philistine leaders came to her and asked her to get the secrets of Samson's strength because they couldn't bind him and they couldn't control him. And they offered her a lot of money to find that information out. It tells us that the scriptures unfold that he had been, um, a, she had attempted to coerce him on three different occasions and he got up and he was in full strength and he was able to resist being captured. And she whined and she complained to him and finally he gave in and told her on the fourth time. And the tragedy of Samson's story is that he became so entangled with what he was doing in his own pursuits, he lost perspective. He became enslaved to his desires and his wants over the bigger picture of what he should do as a leader. And he lost everything. He lost his freedom. They took out his eyes. He lost his eyes, his eyesight. He lost his leadership. And eventually he's lost his life. But at the end of his life, he repented and he said, God, let me, let me in this one last act be able to do something to take down the, the oppressors, the enemies of Israel. And God gave him strength one last time and he was able to pull down a, a temple on and many, many, many Philistine people. Now, at that point, Israel was able to begin to throw off the bondage and the entanglement that they got themselves into. And a lot of times, Unfortunately, it's that 
rough road we go through that we realize that I have to break some of the things in my life or, and if I can't, I need to get supports and, and the biggest support of coming to God, repenting and saying, God, I need your help to get out of this mess. There's a lot of different quotes out there for being, um, becoming untangled. Uh, I got these from azquotes.com. It says, spiritual growth is more than procedure. It's a wild search for God in the midst of the tangled jungle of our souls, a search for which involves a volatile mix of messy reality, wild freedom, frustrating stuckness, increasing slowness, and a healthy dose of gratitude. That was from Mike Iaconelli. Richard Foster said, the truth of the matter is, we all come to prayer with a tangled mess and mass of motives of altruistic and selfish, merciful and hateful, loving and bitter thoughts. And frankly, this side of eternity, we will never unravel the good from the bad, the pure from the impure, but God is big enough to receive us with all our mixture. So despite ourselves and despite the things we're in, um, entangled in in our life, somehow God sees with merciful eyes and heart that there are things that we are struggling with and trying to make breakthroughs in our life. And with his help, he can get us through. Lysa Turquist said, spending some time getting quiet can really be the best remedy for tangled uh, situations. Taking a step back from all the emotion, the frustration and the exhaustion to sit quietly with Jesus will do more to untangle a mess than anything else I've ever found. And Max Licato said, somewhere, sometime, somehow, you got tangled up in garbage and you've been avoiding God. You've allowed a veil of guilt to come between you and your father. You wonder if you could ever feel close to God again. And the message of the torn flesh is you can. God welcomes you. God is not avoiding you. God is not resisting you. The curtain is down, the door is open, and God invites you in. I'm so glad for that today because there's times when my life becomes a mess and it becomes tangled and I need to come to God. And sometimes, you know, we do dumb things. Sometimes we sin. And, uh, you know, to, to hear someone say they've never sinned is like, uh, hmm, did you stretch a truth this week? Did you add a component in the conversation? Did you kind of give a slight saying of something that wasn't quite completely true? You know, we, we all can sin. It's a very capable um, component of us as human beings. We can all do that. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not, people do sin. And we have to come back to our loving Father and acknowledge these things and say, I recognize what I did, please help me, and help me not to do that again. You know, the scriptures give us some real good encouragement. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 4 to 5, it says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer just as we as Christians want to please our, our master, Jesus. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not leave the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So to get that crown, to receive that crown, you have to do the rules. People who, uh, I remember years ago, a Boston Marathon, someone had gotten into a cab and, and uh, missed a lot of the race in order to get across to the finish line. Later it was found out, and because of their deception, they were not allowed to... Uh, to uh, compete to, to get the satisfaction of victory over the finish line. Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You know, that's one of the things about growing in life and the maturing of life is we discover things that are good and evil, things that are right and wrong in our lives, and we know what we can do to avoid certain things. And when we do get ourselves messed up and stuff, we can still come back to God acknowledge these things, repent, and turn from them. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything, everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. You know, when we set our eyes upon Jesus and want him to lead us and direct us, it's amazing how he gives wisdom not only through the word, through friends and loved ones that uh, love him as well, and our own personal prayer time, we discover that God gives such great direction in our lives if we're willing to respond and listen to those things. Proverbs 5.22 says, The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them, and the cords of their sins hold them fast. 
a, a great picture of what it means to really become entangled with things that will destroy your life and uh, to be ensnared and to be held in such a way that you can't break free. Things tangle us, folks, all of us, and we need to realize that they will destroy us if they're not challenged and met. Proverbs 22, 24 to 25 says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. It's amazing even the influences and friends that we have, some of them, uh, they rub off on us, don't they? And some of their traits, they might not have some great traits and there are some things that can trap our own lives. So we have to be guarding of our lives so that we can be uh, people that have um, um, the ability to go forward rather than being stuck in a trap that will bind up our life. So what kind of things get us, you know, trapped up in life and entangled? Well, there's lots of slavery out there and you know, the challenge is to think, well, what are the things that enslave us personally? There's slavery to addictions, you know, there's tobacco, there's alcohol, there's TV, there's junk food, there's illicit online material. You know, there's a lot of things that, um, that want to basically steal our freedom and our happiness. Big picture is, is it really worth it? If you're trapped by these things, these addictions, is it really bringing you happiness and freedom? Some people are slaves to work. They have an unbalanced personal life as well as family life, and work has become everything. I think in the time of COVID here, a lot of people, the challenge is working remotely and trying to figure out, well, how do I balance out work now that it's in my home and make sure that I balance it with my family and also have that time for ourselves and some engagement with friends as much as we can. There's slavery to success. You lose sight of personal integrity and honor for the dollar sometimes rather than the internal rewards. And for many people that have gone through life and have accumulated a lot of wealth, you know, sometimes wealth brings a lot of headaches as well. But if you're just a slavery to success and you don't see the big picture of the balance of life and if you're giving into things that may question your integrity or your ethical stance in, in the efforts to gain the dollar, sometimes you have to consider why you're doing what you're doing. Why are you a slave to that? There's some who want the slavery of pleasure the next vacation, going to the casino, playing the slots, um, some method of personal gratification. And it becomes self-focused and self can get entangled and become slaves to it. And slavery to fear. What holds you back in your life? Worries, anxieties, what keeps you trapped in the same cycle? I'm not gonna do that because I'm afraid it won't work. I'm, I won't do this because you know people might not accept me. They might reject me. You know, a lot of things get us entangled and we have to consider why they have such pull in our life. I came across this uh, story, it called um, Sin and Slaves and Forgiveness Frees is by Stephen Cole. Uh, he was reading an article by Richard Hofler, his uh, book, I think it was, Will Daylight Come? And the story is this, a little boy visiting his grandparents has, well, was given a, a slingshot, his first one, and he practiced in the woods, but he could never hit his target. As he came back to his grandma and grandpa's backyard, he spied her pet duck and on an impulse, he took aim and let fly. The stone hit and the duck fell dead. The boy panicked. Desperately, he hid the dead duck in the woodpile only to look up and see his sister watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. After lunch that day, grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today. Didn't you, Johnny? She whispered to him, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked if children wanted to go out fishing and, and Grandma said, I'm, I'm sorry, but I still need Sally to help me make supper. Sally smiled and said, that's all taken care of. Johnny wants to do it. Again, she whispered, remember the duck. Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of Johnny doing his, his chores and Sally's, he finally couldn't stand it. And he confessed to grandma that he'd killed the duck. I know Johnny, she said, giving him a hug. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing. Because I love you, I forgave you. I wondered how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. Isn't that what Satan does? He looks for opportunity to destroy our lives. And he whispers in our ear, remember when you did that? Remember when you sinned? 
Remember how tangled your life is? Who could ever use you? God would never want to use you. And Satan puts all these kind of lies. But the moment confession comes and repentance and acknowledgement of these things, God, just like this grandma, lovingly says, I know, I saw it, I forgive you. How long will you stay enslaved? That's why Galatians says, stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made us free and don't be entangled again in the sin. Don't be entangled again in that bondage. John Piper said, we look at the life we live from the backside of the tapestry a lot of times. And most of the time, what we see is loose threads, tangled knots and the like. But occasionally, God's light shines through the tapestry and we get a glimpse of the larger design with God weaving together the darks and the lights of existence. Now, is there a way out of our mess of being tangled? There we are. There are many ways. David Burns in his book, The Feeling Good Handbook, wrote down, he said, write down negative thoughts so you can see and read any cognitive, cognitive distortions that you think may either be a problem or a potential future issue. Notice your triggers and eliminate or prepare for them. Set healthy boundaries and stick to them. Accept yourself and accept that none of us are perfect. And take time to celebrate your wins. As I close this morning, I came across uh, an article, Seven Steps to Walking the Spiritual Walk from Crossway Org by Kenneth Birding on March 12th of 2012. And he took the examples from the Book of Romans and the New Testament. He encourages us to walk in the Spirit, in Romans 8, 4. Do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That means is letting God rule your life rather than your fleshly impulses. Secondly, set your mind on the things of the Spirit in Romans 8, 5. In other words, have your mind set on what the Spirit of God desires. Thirdly, put to death the deeds of the body by the Spirit. In other words, from Romans 8, 13, it's saying, it's saying to us, say no to sin. Fourthly, be led by the Spirit in Romans 8, 14. And it says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Fifthly, know the fatherhood of God by the Spirit. In Romans 8, 15 to 17, basically that passage tells us that we're not slaves, but we're heirs of God. We are adopted by him. Sixthly, hope in the spirit in Romans 8, 22 to 25. And that hope is that one day we will be with God. We will be with the Lord Jesus, the savior of our souls, who gave his life willingly and has promised us eternal life. That's our hope. And lastly, pray in the spirit. In Romans 8, 26 to 28, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God intercedes. He knows what's going on in our life. He knows the messes and the tangles. And if we allow the Holy Spirit to intercede in our prayer life, we discover with him the will of God to be accomplished in us. I just want to challenge us today to remember that we don't have to live a life in, of entanglement. God wants to free us and wants to untangle our lives. He wants to give us purpose, meaning, and he wants to continue to build us. God is in the business of building people because people matter to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you today that your great love shines into our lives. At so many times we discover the tangles and the messes that we've gone through and we realize we need a savior. We need a deliverer. We need someone to come in and make the mess perfectly straight and well in our lives. And so Lord, I just pray for my friends today that if they're in a tangled mess in their lives, that as we concluded talking about the, the desire of the Holy Spirit to help us to become um, children of God and to live for your pleasure and to, to really see our lives become entangled, we must invite the Holy Spirit to do so. Help us to live for you, Lord, and to surrender things that are tangling our lives that we may live more productively and effectively and see the grace and the mercy of Jesus working in us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you folks. Great to have you today. Uh, just a little uh, business note. Um, uh, we are planning our annual general meeting in the next little while. We'll be uh, selecting new board members and uh, we'll have that information out to you soon. Uh, we just pray that you'll uh, remember those around you where you can help and minister into lives and encourage one another. God bless you. Have a great week ahead.